FM is here. I'm here. Great. Okay. Well, I'm going to um, make sure that it's actually two o'clock. I'm going to get started. Um, so I'm I guess I should just let you all know who I am. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jen Golden, the past president of Braille Literacy Canada, and I'm going to, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our second speaker this afternoon, uh, Dr. Frances Mary DeAndrea, and I'm going to quickly, I'm going to read her bio just so that I don't leave anything out, but um, I met FM in 2012 at the ICEB General Assembly in South Africa, where um, we also went to a safari and uh, got to pet a lion cub, which was pretty exciting. So, okay, um, on to the official things. And what's going to happen is I'll, I'll read the bio and then I will hand things over to FM. And then um, when her talk is finished around 2.30 or so, um, Anthony... Um, We'll, we'll have some Q&A, and I don't want to give anything away, but possibly um, another door prize. So with that, here, here we go. Frances Mary DeAndrea, PhD, is an assistant professor of practice at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, before joining the faculty at Pitt, she was an educational consultant specializing in literacy issues for students with visual impairments, and she was an adjunct instructor at several U.S. universities. She was a teacher of students with visual impairments in various schools. And from 1995 to 2005, she worked at the American Foundation for the Blind, AFB, and helped establish their National Literacy Center. Center. She's a past chair of the Braille Authority of North America, BANA, and she's served as AFB's representative to BANA since 1998. She's currently the secretary of the International Council on English Braille, ICEB. She's the author of several books, including, sorry, textbooks, including uh, Ash, uh, I'm sorry, the Ashcroft Program in, Instruction in Braille. Uh, Unite. Uni <laughs> I don't know what my problem is. I'm sorry. Apparently, it's Friday afternoon. Uh, unified English Braille. <laughs> Good thing I'm not doing the talk. Uh, she serves on numerous committees and national task forces related to the education of students with visual impairments. So um, that's a that's a lot of stuff. I don't know how you where you find time to sleep, FM. But I'm going to hand it over to you now. Uh, thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Jen, and thanks, everybody, for uh, inviting me. Um, I love following Kay because I always find Kay's talks so interesting and inspiring, and um, <clears throat> I would love to continue that conversation as well um, and enjoyed reading everybody's um, favorite contractions on the chat. Um, I have a PowerPoint up, but in the chat, um, there's a copy of my PowerPoint that you can download um, and, and follow along, but <clears throat> I'll, um, because I only have a half an hour, I'll, I'll try to go over this as quickly as I can because I really want to get to, to the questions. So um, my presentation is how many Braille readers and why it matters. <clears throat> and this was um, a project that actually we started um, several years ago, and this is not just my project at all. I just have the privilege of being able to share it with you all today. So I want to acknowledge my collaborators <coughs> in this, um, uh, Dr. Rebecca Sheffield, um, Dr. Val Marash, Valerie Marash, and <coughs> Sarah Chatfield. Um, and um, I also, oops, I have to make sure I can advance this slide. Okay. Um, and um, I also want to acknowledge um, um, the memory of, of our <clears throat> friend and collaborator, Val Marash, who uh, died um, a few years ago, um, suddenly in, a, in, in an accident. And um, it was a great, great loss um, to not only to our project, but to the field at large, um, because Val was intensely interested in, in Braille and um, was a, an amazing um, thinker and researcher. Um, so, um, let me just tell you a little bit about this, this project. Um, and I have on this slide, it says, everybody knows. Um, and then the question, or do we? Um, because I think we uh, see a, um, in um, certain statistics and numbers related to Braille and Braille literacy and Braille readers that are just shared as common knowledge. And so for example, 
there we go. <clears throat> On the next slide, I have three quotes that actually come from the um, kind of the mainstream press. So one quote is, advocates of the tactile writing system are wrestling with how to address record low braille literacy. And that's from um, the Associated Press um, uh, uh, Bulletin. Uh, another quote was, in an environment where only 10% of blind children receive braille instruction, which comes from the PR Newswire. And the, a third quote, which is, in 1970, more than half of blind American school children could read Braille, now only about 10% can, which came from The Economist. So we, we see these kinds of statistics shared widely um, in not just in, in our fields, but also in the mainstream press, and they're repeated over and over again. Um, often without any attribution at all, as I'll get to in a minute. And it, these, um, this kind of common knowledge um, is also something that got us thinking. And so the next slide I just say, so how do we know what we think we know? Um, because seeing these kinds of quotes over and over again, got us thinking, and it was interesting um, that <laughs> Rebecca Sheffield, who at the time was working at um, the American Foundation for the Blind as one of their, their research folks, um, and Val, who was working at Smith Kettlewell at the time doing research, and I was as an educational consultant at the time and doing textbooks and lots of things. It was funny that the three of us, um, had all started kind of collecting information about these statistics and, and the source of them. And at some point, I actually don't even remember how the three of us got together and said, you know, we really should do a project about this. Um, where did these numbers come from? Where did these statistics come from? How do we know whether that's correct or not? So <clears throat> we started a project um, to investigate this so-called common knowledge. So our research questions were, so how many, and I'm putting in quotes, braille readers, unquote, are there in the United States? Uh, another question was, what percentage of, and quote, people who are visually impaired, unquote, and then quote, read braille, unquote. And I'll tell you why these words are in quotes in a, in a minute, but our, our underlying question was, what evidence do we have to back up these numbers? Um, and these, these terms, braille readers, um, read braille, <clears throat> that's kind of an essential question. And as we got into our project, um, it led to some really interesting results. So let me tell you first what our process was, what we did to kind of answer this, this question. And we did a lengthy and systematic um, literature search. We did an electronic search, and this is, I'm giving you just the really short um, view of the process. We actually have submitted this um, article for uh, publication and it was accepted. So it will be published in the Journal of Visual Impairment and Blindness um, at some point in the future. And I go into a lot, we, go into a lot more detail um, about our um, uh, research methods in, in that article. So I'm just gonna give you kind of the capsule view today. So we did an electronic search of all the records that we could find to, to 2015. And then we did a second search um, uh, um, from 2015 to 2019, uh, coming up with 4,383 sources. Um, we looked um, at existing reviews, um, and then we did a hand search, especially for older materials. So we looked at um, documents, the Journal of Visual Impairment and Blindness, for example, has been around in various names for, um, it was the, I think the new beacon and the outlook for the blind. Going back to 1907, we looked at, um, before there was an AER, there were two separate organizations, AAWB and AAIB, and we went back to their convention publications. Going back to the 1800s, we really wanted to find any kind of research just from historical up to the present that had that reported um, actual reading rates um, or any kind of statistics. So um, we 
looked at all the titles and abstracts. We deleted the duplicates. Um, we created this huge spreadsheet um, and we found, um, and, and as I did a, a hand search of even older materials. And we looked through all of those sources and we retained 95 that um, actually reported rates of braille literacy. Um, so uh, the next slide to talk about what were those 95 sources that reported a braille literacy rate. So of those 95, there were 39 that affirmed some braille literacy rate, but it didn't have a source. It didn't say where that num where the numbers that were, they were reporting came from. Um, 19 of those sources cited the American Printing House Federal Quota Census, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Um, nine of the uh, sources that we found cited one of those 39 articles, but again, it, those articles didn't have any sources with them. Um, four cited a document that had been written by the National Federation of the Blind um, that um, reported some, some uh, rates. And only seven cited primary source research um, where, it, where the questions were, how many Braille readers are there? Um, and um, so let's take a look at what those um, primary sources were. And on the next slide, I have them listed chronologically. Um, so we're going back to 1935, and there was a study done by Hire um, that looked just at the state of New Jersey. And of the 2,500 people surveyed, um, one third reported that they were literate in raised type. So if you have to think about what 1935 was like, it was um, the uh, the English Braille American Edition contracted Braille was only a few years old at that point because um, it wasn't until 1932 that it was actually um, adopted um, English Braille American Edition, the 1932 edition, which was different from the 1959 edition, different from the 1994 edition. So at that point, that's about a third in New Jersey. Um, a study done um, in 1941 of New York schools um, recorded of the students in the New York City schools, um, uh, elementary schools, there were 84 who were in what they called site conservation classes at the time, um, and six were braille readers. Of the junior high schools, there were no braille readers, and of the senior high schools, there were three braille readers. Um, and again, that was 19, uh, 1941 in New York City. A 1945 study um, from the New York Association for the Blind found that 28% of the people in the, who were associated with the Lighthouse in the New York Association, 28% um, read Braille and 3% read New York Point or Moon Type. Um, you know, the um, I know that there were uh, magazines like the Matilda Ziegler magazine. Um, published, I think, New York Point up to like 1960. So there were other tactile um, codes that were still being used in the early part of the uh, 1900s. Um, uh, a study in 1960 by Bray estimated that, quote, less than one sixth of the National Library Service regional library customers read Braille. Uh, 1964, Josephson's reported about a third of um, people who were drawn randomly from state registers reported being able to read Braille. Um, 1979, Berkowitz reported that Braille is used most frequently as compared to other media by only 2% of readers with NLS eligible print limitations. And a study by uh, Chris Craig in 2002 looked just at the state of Missouri reporting about 19%. So, we see a real um, difference from state to state um, and from study to study about how um, the, the statistics were gathered and how they were reported um, uh, over, over time. So the next slide I talk about issues with primary sources and the citations. First of all, of those primary sources, only three include national level data or estimates. Uh, the others were um, state uh, level, uh, like the state of Missouri or the city of New York or the state of New Jersey. 
Most of these primary sources, as you probably also notice, are now decades old, the most recent being 2002, which believe it or not was almost 20 years ago. I know I have a hard time believing that. Um, the other thing we found in looking at all of these, um, these articles was that the methods were not always clear, like how it, the, the methods were, um, what methods they used, or they weren't rigorous. Sometimes they were just telephone surveys or going back a slide, um, there was a survey that drew randomly from state registers. That's not really a rigorous um, collection of data. The other thing we found is that some of the citations are extrapolations or estimates that are based on incomplete or old data. So for example, in 1996, the American Foundation for the Blind published in the Journal of Visual Impairment and Blindness a demographics report, and it was on the AFB website for um, a while. I was working at AFB at the time. And that demographics re report in 96 was based on the 1979 Berkowitz survey. So in 1996, they were using data that were already 17 years old and that had been done by a study that I think was done by a, I think that was the telephone survey um, <clears throat> uh, of just NLS users. So it wasn't even, um, so that was just a subset of, of um, people. And the other thing that we found is that some of the citations were based on the um, American Printing House, the APH Federal Quota Statistics. And I should also say um, that the, this, this project that we have been doing is only looking at the, um, the United States. At one point, we thought about whether we should add Canada or other, other countries or any, and it was just too big. <laughs> It was too big, there were too many. Um, the spreadsheet was already complicated enough. So we decided that we were just going to focus just on the, um, on the United States. Um, I'd really be interested in knowing if Canada had any statistics like this. Um, so anyway, as I was saying, some citations were based on the APH federal quota. Um, and um, when you look at the APH statistics over time, the categories changed in 1985. So you can't really compare populations from the early 60s and, and, and so on to um, any time after 1985 because the, the categories aren't, aren't the same. Um, the other um, issue with the APH federal quota census um, is that, um, Again, that's only a subset of people. For those of you who are not familiar with the federal quota, the American Printing House um, does a census each, each year of how many students who are enrolled in a program that's 12th grade or below, even if they're adults, but if they're in a program that's 12th grade or below, who are legally blind, or um, they have a new category um, that captures functions at the level of blind, I think is what they call it. I don't remember the exact words right now. Um, so it doesn't, again, there's just a subset of, of people. And APH is very careful to, to have, um, to say that their quota data should be used really carefully. And there's a statement on the APH website called appropriate use of federal quota census data. Um, and it states that this, the specific purpose of the annual federal quoted census is to register students in the United States and outlying areas who meet the definition of blindness and are eligible for adapted educational materials. Statements regarding student literacy, use of appropriate learning media, and students taught in a specific medium cannot be supported using APH registration data. So we have to be really careful when we're using these <clears throat> um, the APH census because it's not the purpose of it and it's not to be extrapolated in that way. And in fact, if you look at the APH data, they have the, um, the census data reported in different ways. They, they collect primary um, uh, reading medium, secondary reading medium. They have a um, 
a, a very large category of what they call pre-readers, um, those kind of students in the emergent literacy uh, level, and also what they call non-readers for whatever reason that students are, are registered in that way. So um, depending on how you look at the data, um, it you get different statistics anyway, even though, as I said, you're not, they're, they're not designed to give information about actual, um, um, how many people are using particular media. Here's the other issue that came up that was really important that made it especially difficult to capture any kind of statistics um, in a clear way. And that is there, are, there were no clear definitions at all as to what a braille learner was um, or a braille reader or a braille user. And that's why when I showed us the showed you all the research questions, we had to put those terms in quotes. They were search terms, but we broadened the search terms as much as we could because what we found was, um, does a braille reader mean someone who's a proficient braille reader or someone who just uses braille reading for some purposes and not others? Do they use braille exclusively? Do they use braille? Braille primarily, what if they use both Braille and print? Um, what if they've taught Braille, uh, been taught some Braille, but they tend not to use it for other things? Um, what if they get all of their instructional materials in Braille? So there was no clear definition, there was no consistent definition of what Braille literacy even meant and what a Braille user, reader, or learner was. In fact, there were no clear definitions, even as far as what we meant by blind people or visually impaired people. So when um, we looked at sources such as the, the US Census, the Washington Group on Disability Statistics, the National Center on Health Statistics, the World Health Organization, the so Social Security Administration, and um, the uh, OSEP, the Office of Special Education Projects that that collects data through the federal um, law, IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And there was not one clear definition. There were a lot of definitions that were self-report um, or they were based on kind of functional activities um, rather than like an acuity measure or something else. So, um, and in fact, one of the articles we found by John Cruz and his, his colleagues they did an analysis of 12 federally funded um, uh, projects, and they noted that there were different questions on every single one of those for how visual, visual impairments was defined. So even within the, uh, um, the US federal government that you would think be trying to collect these data, um, there was no clear <laughs> definitions and the question of are you blind was asked in a different way in all of these these occasions. So um, you can see how that could definitely lead to some issues when you're trying to find some comparative data, when you're trying to collect data um, that is clear as to who we're talking about and um, um, how these, these data are used. We also found that a lot of it, the, the um, questions changed depending on who was asking and for what purpose. So there we go. So overall findings. <clears throat> and then I wanna to get to the, the discussion. And um, so we really found there was no clear support for that 10% Braille literacy rate statistic that we see all, all over time. We, there, we did not find any um, definitive um, or frankly, even suggestive <laughs> um, support for that statement. Um, we found that the shifting definitions, not only you know, through the APH census, but through all of these other data collection sources, even at the federal level, made it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to compare rates and numbers over time. Um, and even looking at those primary sources that I showed you earlier from 1935 to, to 2002, there was no clear indication at all um, as to um, how many people were Braille readers <laughs> and, and how those numbers were, were um, collected. So 
our third finding really is that it's unclear if there's a documented decrease in Braille usage um, because to some extent, it's easier now than ever to produce Braille or to create Braille or to use um, a, um, a portable Braille device, a refreshable Braille device um, to access materials and information using Braille. At the same time, there's also been a rise in um, speech access. So does one outweigh the other or we don't know and it's really difficult to be able to tell. There doesn't seem to be any support for the statement that in the 70s, you know, over half the, the children learned Braille because um, we don't have that data. And we don't know what learned Braille meant because there's no definition for it. I know this sounds really picky, but it's important to be able to have clear definitions if you're trying to count something. And because of the difficulty in, um, in the, the, the way these things have been defined and counted over time, it's difficult to come up with that. So if there is a decrease in Braille reading, as I said, we can't determine a rate or a cause of any such decline. Um, and I'll be honest, some of these findings were, were quite surprising to us as a team, and we had a lot of conversations about it and the implications of it. So um, in this discussion, um, we are um, proposing several things, and then um, I'll, I'll tell you about our call to action. So the... The, the thing is, when we don't have recent, especially recent, reliable sources of data to support any statistics, we have to be careful when we're providing numbers, whether it's in a research publication or even in the mainstream media. What messages are we sending? Um, and um, how can we make sure that we're, pro we're providing information that's accurate? As a professional field, we shouldn't be repeating statistics without citations. We certainly should have some citations. And we also have to be really careful about how we um, present information so that it's accurate. The other thing we found is how many Braille readers are there is a really complex question. So it's important to consider what we want to know and why we want to know it. Um, and we. Um, we were, you know, our, just our, our little team, our, our thoughts are, you know, it's important to have information, especially for um, policy decisions, um, because policy should be set on actual accurate data and not on, um, as Rebecca Sheffield said, it was like a game of telephone. I don't remember if you are familiar with that game when you're kids and you, you sit in a circle and you whisper something into somebody's ear and they and then they whisper it in the next person's ear and it goes all the way around the circle and you see whether it came out the same as it came in and it like never does. So the question is complex for the reasons that I said, but we also want to make sure, are we asking the right question? And this is where we had our, our call to action. And that is first, we should use data responsibly and we should be thinking about what is being reported and for what purpose. Again, if we're, if we're using um, data to support um, the um, need for um, uh, resources for, for services, then we should really be capturing that information um, in a more consistent way. So we really need to advocate for clear and consistent terminology and definitions. Um, we should advocate for consistent and rigorous data collection at state and national levels. And one of the reasons why in the United States, the Coswell Macy Act that has been proposed by AER, and maybe some of you are, are familiar with 
with hearing about this through AER is so important because one, uh, we know already that in the United States, the numbers of children with visual impairments is undercounted through the um, IDEA reporting because the they only are states are only required to report primary disability and many of our kids have other disabilities as well. So we already know that there are um, states that are reporting X number of children who are blind, but they're providing Braille materials for at three or four times that number of, of students. But it's not that that data is not reported anywhere because it's not required to be reported. And for us, the more salient question is, um, are the children and adults who could benefit from Braille instruction, are they actually receiving it? And that becomes a, an issue of capacity um, and of um, recognition because the, the importance of Braille literacy can't be, um, can't be undervalued. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's essential. And um, if we are undercounting or if we don't have clear numbers, if we don't have a clear way of collecting those, those data, are we actually doing the best we can to make sure that um, folks are um, receiving the Braille instruction um, that they could benefit from? And Natalie, um, uh, Martin Yellow and I have had that conversation, especially for adults, very much. Um, uh, here's a question in the, the chat. You know, the question is, what were the purposes of the articles? Um, were they trying to show that funding was being wasted on Braille literacy or that there's schools for the blind? You know, that's a really interesting question, Carrie, because um, some of the articles were more towards... Uh, like a fundraising sort of thing <laughs> um, that see we don't have enough braille materials therefore you know you should be supporting our efforts or and other things were um, possibly um, related to um, not being not providing braille so for example manufacturers um, or um, folks who are um, uh, the pharmaceutical companies in um, the EU, they're required to put Braille on packaging. Um, so if we are sending a message that Braille is not important or that not very many people use it, are we then again, undervaluing the, the um, benefits of Braille for people who could use it? All right, so that's my half hour. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I'm up for questions. Somebody else said we're living in an era of widespread misinformation. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to, um, before we get to the, the q and I just want to, so that we don't run out of time, take this opportunity to thank you very much for coming and, and uh, doing this presentation, I found it both uh, informative and actually encouraging because as a Braille reader, I've always really hated that statistic because people in the field and people, even I, the media in Canada uses this statistic a lot. And it always came across to me like, well, only 10% of people read Braille. So it's not really that important. And of course, we, we all know that uh, Braille really is important. So I think this is very, uh, very good information for all of us to have. And I'm so excited that you guys did this research. So thanks. That and the, the last slide I have um, our, our contact information. If you want to, um, you know, send us email, Rebecca Sheffield and me and, and Sarah, and we want to thank APH and AER for letting us look at their archives. And thanks to Eric Caruso and Daisy Lee, who were research assistants. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't realize you nope, had a last nope. slide. No <laughs> um, Natalie, are you yes, wanting to I am do here. a door prize? Okay, well, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Jen, and thank you, Francis Mary. I'm very excited about this research. Um, BLC gets this question a lot. How, how many Braille readers are there? What's the Braille literacy rate? And we, we try to um, 
kind of go through what you very eloquently <laughs> went through today. And so um, one of the questions I'll have for you is, is you might have mentioned this at the beginning, but whether this is published yet, because I'd love to um, send this as a resource in future when we get this uh, very common question. 